So tell me, let me jump a little bit because I know it's it's in the minds of my audience. How do you see the resurgence of white supremacy into the headlines of our society, into the consciousness? Into you know why is it re? Why is this happening when so many believed, rightly or wrongly, that somehow that was behind us? Can you help us? How do you understand that? Well, I try, right? I was going to say I can help. Uh, yeah, I can help you at the same time. I try to help myself. Um, so I taught for a long time a grad seminar in 20th century race theory, and after the first four or five weeks, the graduate students found, found themselves getting really depressed because they came to realize that that sort of um, Whiggish narrative, right, of progress uh, didn't quite, quite work. And they came to recognize that the commitments to inegalitarian ideologies aren't based on evidence, they're ontological. Uh, so what happens is when one narrative of naturalized inequality gets defeated, uh, then it doesn't go away. But what happens is those people who are committed to, to a belief that there are um, essential meaningful differences among subsections of, of, of homo sapiens will just say to themselves, well, I know it's true, but, 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 but we don't have, just don't have the evidence yet to demonstrate it. So then when somebody well, discovers genes, then they all get, Get, get happy and say, ah, aha, so now we can get the evidence. So white supremacy is an ideology, right? Um, I mean, I remember like when, well, yeah, I assume when we were both living in Southern Connecticut, it, in the early 80s, the Klan marched in Meriden. Right. And, and my colleagues were going nuts about this, right? Uh, 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 and asked me what this meant. I said, well, look, in first place, the Klan in, in a Meriden is a bunch of alienated, you know, disaffected, washed out of the working class people, right? They were mainly youngsters. But the first wave of what the de industrialization was gonna look like. From 1868 to 1970, right? The, um, you know, the operative question was, it was in the South at least, and, and, and of course in the 20s, the claim was something different anyway, but was in the South at least whether it was more significant that the Klan was the above or the underground wing of the Democratic Party, or that the Democratic or, or the Democratic Party was the above ground wing of the Klan. So, so it was a powerful political and social institution. White supremacy a, as an ideology has been around since race was invented, basically, right? Or at least since the 19th century, and it's there, right, as a set of you know scapegoating. Uh, discourses, frankly, like, like I, I blame uh, the rise of white supremacy uh, or the resurgence, if you want to call it that, of white supremacy as much on on the neoliberalized, I mean, Democratic Party, as as I do on the right, right. And my good friend Anthony Muzaki often said that ne neoliberalism can't satisfy people's needs and concerns and anxieties. Um, uh, the farther along it goes, the more and more people who, who are going to be tossed onto the ash heap. And if we aren't there to provide them with plausible explanations of what's messing their lives up, and at least the outline of a plausible seeming, seeming roadmap about how to make things better, then, then, then these right-wing forces that have always been there doing the same, same thing, offering the same set of bromides and snake oil and of scapegoating are going to be there to take advantage of it. And I think, like I've argued this too, I think you have as well, that, that, that we may have gotten to a point at which, um, you know, like the equivalent of a T intersection, right? At which, at which the neoliberalism has exhausted its capacities for delivering enough to, to enough of the population to maintain its legitimacy as a political system. And, and if that's happened, then there are only Two ways to go, like you know, like you know, like at the T intersection. One is to the right, and that's authoritarianism and fascism. And I, you know, I don't like to. You know, uh, um, you know, I also understand that academics like to quibble about when authoritarianism becomes fascism or whatever. And my view is that w that w when the question arises, right, uh, it's it it's it, it's beyond time 
to think about taxonomizing it, right? All you need to do is figure out how to fight it, right? But the other direction is in our direction, basically. And, and, and the big punchline is, like with everything else, that what we need is, is to figure out how to start generating a movement anchored in the working class that can restore popular faith in public action, public life, public goods, 